Hi, I think I've teased doing another iceberg before, so I'm going to start the new year off with just that. This iceberg is my own creation with the help from my brothers, and inspired from the many followed icebergs on Google Images when inputting the search term followed iceberg. I referenced a bunch and all at different times, so shout out to anyone who has ever made a followed iceberg. With that being said, this iceberg, along with its entries and placements within the iceberg, are my own creation. This is the unhinged followed iceberg. I call it the unhinged followed iceberg for a couple reasons. As the tiers go deeper, I think the entries get more unhinged, meaning that as we make our way down to tier 5, they get more outlandish and stray very far away from confirmed lore and more so into wild conspiracy land. Two, the tiers themselves aren't even really that concrete in terms of having a theme. Obviously there is a wild difference between tier 1 and tier 5, but arguments could be made to shift some entries up one or down one. This iteration of the iceberg is what I'm going with though. Without further ado, let's get into tier 1 of the Fallout iceberg. Circle of Steel First up is the Circle of Steel. The Circle of Steel in canon is a branch of the Brotherhood of Steel dedicated to ensuring that Brotherhood members are upholding the values of the group. They're like the Internal Affairs Department of the Steel. Christine Royce from Dead Money is the only known member of the group. She was sent by the Circle of Steel to assassinate the rogue elder Elijah. Outside of canon, the Circle of Steel was meant to play a role in the cancelled Fallout 3 project Van Buren. In Van Buren, the Circle of Steel was formed after a team of Brotherhood soldiers began to suffer the side effects of extensive stealth boy use. Feeling paranoid over their peers, comrades, and leaders, this group fled the Lost Hills bunker and formed their own covert group. The goal of the Circle of Steel in Van Buren was to 1. recover lost technology, but also rebuild the glory of the Brotherhood at any cost. I think the portrayal of the Circle of Steel between both games is quite interesting. In New Vegas, Circle of Steel member Royce is hunting a rogue elder that wishes to restart the Brotherhood, but in Van Buren, the Circle of Steel are a rogue group that want to restart the Brotherhood themselves. Although I personally find the leaking of unfinished work to be a tad distasteful, it's also neat to see how certain rough ideas from past projects make their way into the current ones. Brahmin Tipping Here's a nifty mechanic that has no use outside of being part of a challenge in New Vegas, and that is Brahmin Tipping. Brahmin Tipping has appeared in four of the six canon games as well as Fallout Tactics. In the first Fallout, you can tip over a Brahmin by using beer on them. In Fallout 2, using the push command will sometimes tip over the mutant bovine. In Fallout 3 and New Vegas, if you crouch near a Brahmin while unarmed and use the activate button, the Brahmin will enter a ragdoll state. And in Tactics, Brahmin Tipping is part of a special encounter. Brahmin Tipping is a reference to the urban legend of Cow Tipping. For those who don't know, Cow Tipping was a supposed activity by young miscreants. The ne'er-do-wells would sneak up to a sleeping or unsuspecting cow and push them over. However, cows don't actually sleep upright, they're startled easily, and are quite hard to topple over, so it's likely that no one has ever successfully cow tipped, outside of course for the purposes of veterinary or husbandry practices. Just a small little easter egg that was unfortunately discontinued in Fallout 4 and 76. Point Lookout T-Rex This is a quick one, but it's interesting nonetheless. Not too far from the coast of Point Lookout, the remains of a Tyrannosaurus Rex can be found. Normally this wouldn't be that out of the ordinary. Dinosaur bones are found across the world, and T-Rexes were known to roam North America. What's strange about the location is that a human skeleton, two ammo canisters, a lever action rifle, and a safe can be found alongside it. Why? And more importantly, how? Perhaps someone was coincidentally dumped from a boat, their belongings along with them, and they just so happened to be next to T-Rex bones. The dinosaur bones weren't that far from the shore, and they are mostly exposed. How come these weren't documented and taken to a museum? Surely someone pre-war would have found them. But then again, who knows what happened in the 200 years between pre-war and the events of Fallout 3. It's always hard to speculate. It's just one of those Fallout mysteries. Marilyn Companion Veronica Santangelo, after meeting Mr. House, asks, What do you think of Mr. House? I'm surprised he only had the two robots slaves. But if you go back to the Lucky 38 penthouse and take a look around, you'll only find one robot 
slave. What's up with that? Well, you already know that Mr. House has a weird slave, Securitron Jane, named after American actress Jane Russell. But did you know that he was actually supposed to have two weird robots, slave Securitrons? The second one was going to be named Marilyn, after Marilyn Monroe, of course. Marilyn is a cut Securitron that would fill a similar role to Jane. However, due to problems with her voiceover, she was permanently removed from the game. Interestingly enough, she can be spawned into the game using console commands, where she can be found in the Lucky 38 presidential suite, but her dialogue is quite plain. I don't know, I feel like if I had a lot of money and power, I wouldn't use that to create some creepy spot, but that's just me. Randall Clark The next entry is Randall Clark. Now, I don't really want to go over his story, so I'll save that for a new Legends of the Wastes video. Instead, we're going to go over something much more unhinged, and what could likely be one of the strangest coincidences in Fallout. So, the story of Randall Clark, also known as the Survivalist, was designed by Josh Sawyer. Writer John Gonzalez wrote the diary entries and the logs, but Sawyer designed the story arc, Clark's background, and his relationship with the Sorrows. This is important to note for the coincidence. Randall Clark was a Great War survivor who found himself alone after the bombs took the lives of his family. Now, in this strange new world, Clark would set about doing what many tried to do after the nuclear holocaust, survive. There are many known details about Clark's life post-war thanks to his many journal entries, but what's pertinent to this coincidental tale is what happened 10 years after his arrival to the Morning Glory Cave. At 70 years old, after having lost not only his first family, but also his second, Clark didn't have much else to live for. He initially went to the Morning Glory Cave to peacefully end his own life. He didn't expect to make it to 70, let alone find a new purpose. In April 2123, a group of 24 children made their way into Zion. After eavesdropping on the kids, he had learned that they were fleeing from a place known only as the school. Whatever the reason may have been, Clark felt the need to protect and look after the children. He would do this entirely from the shadows, leaving survival notes, gifts, textbooks, and other practical goods. He told the kids that Zion was the group's reward for all the sorrows they had experienced thus far. It wouldn't take long before the kids began to see Clark as the father, a mythical deity caring for them and protecting the group. But by January 2124, Clark knew he was going to die soon. Clark gave away much of his belongings to the children and left them a final note saying that he would always be watching over and taking care of them. Randall Clark would pass away later that month. The kids would grow into the tribe now known as the Sorrows, worshipping the father in the cave. Now, about 48 years before the release of Fallout New Vegas' Honest Hearts, an episode of the Twilight Zone titled The Old Man in the Cave was first aired. Now, while the exact plot of the episode doesn't follow the same story as Randall Clark's, there are some eerie coincidences. First, both take place in a post-apocalyptic setting after a nuclear holocaust wreaks havoc throughout the United States. Next, a small group of settlers begin being taken care of by an old man in a cave, hence the title of the episode. This old man has never been seen by the group, and is seen as a sort of religious deity keeping them safe from various hazards. In the Twilight Zone, the old man protects them from contaminated food. In Fallout, Clark provides them goods and training. And sure, while the ending of the two tales are seemingly opposites, they both share a similar final theme. In the Twilight Zone, the group discovers the old man is actually a computer, they destroy it out of rage, and end up dying without its guidance. And in Fallout, after Clark's passing, the Soros go on to form a strong and peaceful religious tribe. But in both cases, they show how religions and beliefs can be formed based on necessity. In both the Twilight Zone and Fallout, both groups of survivors built up their respective old man in a cave into a sort of deity and religious figure all because they provided them the means to keep the survivors alive. It makes sense. If some unseen, unexplainable force is helping you out in a dire situation, one will look to create an explanation for it. In Fallout, that's the father in the cave, and in the Twilight Zone, that's the old man in the cave. Now, I've done a lot of yapping about coincidences between the two stories, and one might think, but Nort, it's obvious that Honest Hearts is just referencing that Twilight Zone episode. But here's the kicker. When asked on a Something Awful forum about Randall Clark being a reference to the Twilight Zone, Josh Sawyer mentioned that he had never heard of, nor seen that episode. Freaky, freaky stuff. An all-time coincidence and followed, I think. No Horses 
horses have never once appeared in any followed source. But they have been mentioned plenty of times. Children of the Cathedral cultist Dane really wants a horse. The Chosen One is mentioned enjoying a few jugs of fermented mare's milk. The Giddy Up Buttercup was a popular pre-war toy. Great Con Graffiti depicts some warriors on horses. Paul Revere is riding a horse. Scout leader Jaggy mentions that they miss seeing horses in Appalachia. Horses have been mentioned plenty of times pre- and post-war, but we've never seen them physically in any followed source. Well, except for one. In the New Vegas promotional comic All Roads, for a single comic panel, an NCR soldier can be seen riding upon what appears to be a horse. Now what's interesting is the recent developments surrounding horses in the Fallout universe. In 2013, former Fallout developer Chris Avalon was claimed to note that the inclusion of horses in All Roads was an error, and that a Raoul dialogue about horses was cut because the devs didn't want to imply that horses existed. In 2020, when former Fallout developer Josh Sawyer was asked to confirm to Avalon's comments regarding horses being a mistake in All Roads, he said that he had no idea. However, when this topic was brought back up to Avalon in 2022, he made another statement, clarifying his thoughts about horses in Fallout. He mentioned that horses have been excluded from the universe because they would cause a wide assortment of technical issues if implemented. They also believe that implying the existence of horses but not implementing them would only disappoint the player base, similar to how working vehicles are implied to exist, but we hardly ever see them. It's a valid concern by the developers in my opinion. Avalon concluded his thoughts by saying that horses may exist. Based on all this, I think we can determine that horses definitely existed pre-war, and also likely existed in post-war followed as well. Now, whether or not the NCR makes use of a mounted cavalry division, I don't know. But good news, All Roads is a non-canon source so I guess it's really up to you and your own headcanon. Horses in Fallout. Didn't expect this entry to be this long, to be honest. Intelligent Death Claws. Next is one of the weirdest monstrosities in the Fallout universe. May I present the Intelligent Death Claw? The Intelligent Death Claw is the result of several Enclave experiments on a herd of Death Claws using the forced evolutionary virus. The Enclave wanted a lean, mean, killing machine that could follow orders and be used as a shock trooper. And well, that's what they were, storming Vault 13 along with Enclave soldiers and kidnapping its residents. Although the Intelligent Deathclaw project was a success, after the Deathclaws began questioning the morality of their leaders, they opted to remain in the Vault, making it their new home. Now what's interesting about the Intelligent Deathclaws is that upon retrospection, Many Fallout 2 developers regret the inclusion of the Intelligent Death Claw to the franchise, with Chris Avalon saying, We included talking animals in Fallout 2 anyway, even though they'd been explicitly axed in Fallout 1, and that was a mistake for the most part. Avalon would go on to defend this position by saying that Death Claws were always meant to be a big bad creature, and by making them be able to talk and have reason, it diminishes other encounters with normal Death Claws. Instead of the player feeling like a mighty hero who bested the wasteland's worst, they instead might feel bad for killing a creature that had the potential to be reasoned with. Outside of Avalon, both Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky agreed that talking death claws didn't fit in the world of Fallout. In a roundtable discussion part of Fallout Wiki's celebration of the 25th anniversary of Fallout this past October, Tim Kaine was quoted as saying, I'm not a fan of the talking death claws. They were meant to be the biggest, baddest, scariest thing ever not librarians, with Boyarsky following up with a hear hear in agreement. They were not a fan of the talking mutant lizards. Now for those who don't know, in Fallout 2, unless the Chosen One intervenes, the Enclave will send a fire squad led by Frank Corrigan to the vault, where he will massacre the Death Claws, except for the two who happen to be away at the time, Goris and Zarn. However, due to a dire scripting error, you would never be able to meet the requirements to prevent the massacre leading to the Vault 13 death clause to always die at the hands of Horrigan. Now, because so many developers were not a fan of the creature's inclusion in the game, some speculate that the bugged good ending for the Vault 13 and the intelligent death clause was an intentional way to remove the death clause from the franchise. This bug, combined with a mixed sentiment in the Fallout Bible, a now non-canon source mind you, about whether or not Goris and Zarn could mate has called into question the true fate of the talking death clause. But I think it's safe to say because we haven't seen them in later Bethesda installments, 3, 4, and 76, the talking death claws are gone for good. Pariah Dog Did you know that Fallout has a dog companion not named Dogmeat? 
And no, I'm not talking about the Cyberdog Rex either. I'm talking about the infamous Pariah Dog. Although not an unknown creature by any means, the inclusion of a companion like the Pariah Dog is downright unhinged in and of itself. The Pariah Dog is a special companion that can be found in the special encounter a lone surviving dog. As long as you're at least level 10, you have a chance at getting this encounter. The chosen one happens upon a deadly scene. Mutilated and bloody corpses of settlers, traders, brahmin, and a death claw surround a patchy, ragged dog. Now, while you may be keen to investigate, your best option is to turn around and forget you ever saw the pup. I say this because once you enter the encounter, a timer begins. Once every 10 seconds, a luck check is made. If you pass the luck check, great. But if you ever fail it, you'll be the brand new owner of the pariah dog. A new companion, that's great, isn't it? Well, actually no. When he joins your party, your luck will be set to 1, and you'll gain the Jinxed trait. Jinxed makes it so that everyone around you, including yourself, have more critical failures in combat. The only way to reset your luck and remove the Jinxed trait is if the Pariah Dog dies. But it's again, not that easy. The Pariah Dog has 750 hit points and will always attempt to flee combat. It's really just a twisted encounter and companion. Curse you, Pariah Dog. Companion Ulysses Many of you may know this one, but Ulysses, the primary antagonist of Lonesome Road who is mentioned several times throughout the other DLCs, was originally intended to be a companion in the base game of Fallout New Vegas. His omission is actually a critique by many, as without Ulysses, the New Vegas companions lack one that is sympathetic towards the Legion. The goal of the companion version of Ulysses was to be very involved in the Legion and Sierra conflict, explain the goals of the Legion, and maintain his symbolic, mythical, and cryptic way of storytelling that we see throughout the DLCs. However, at some point late in the development of New Vegas, the team realized that Ulysses' many anecdotes and metaphors took up too much disc space. They literally couldn't fit Ulysses on the disc. He had way too many dialogue notes, with Sawyer saying it was two or three times greater than the next most vocal companion, Cass. Sawyer noted that Cass had 615 dialogue nodes, where the original Ulysses had upwards of 1500. And by the time this realization was made, it would be much too late to trim down the voice lines without gutting what made the character interesting and compelling. It was more practical to tear him out than to rework him. And so Ulysses the Companion was removed, cut from the game. Though when people purchased the New Vegas Collector's Edition and popped open their playing cards, they were still met with the strange Three of Clubs a character that was not in the game. Avalon would tease a future Ulysses appearance during an interview shortly following the game's release, saying, maybe he'll come back at some point. The first DLC in which Ulysses was mentioned, Dead Money, would be released the next month. Another one of those what could have been moments. Fallout Bible. Next on the unhinged iceberg is the Fallout Bible. The Fallout Bible is a series of documents that were released by Fallout developer Chris Avalon throughout 2002. From January 15th to November 7th, Chris would upload regular entries to the Black Isle Studios homepage. The documents include background information on the setting, events within the world, and developer commentary in terms of game development, implementation, and lore, and answered some fan questions. Now, this is just my two cents, and it might make some people mad, but I think the notoriety and the name of the Fallout Bible has made it seem like it's bigger than it actually is. It's not some compendium of all Fallout knowledge. It doesn't override original sources like Fallout 1 and 2 unless otherwise stated. And it's not some trove of goodies that current writers are actively trying to retcon. Avalon notes in Fallout Bible number 0 that it's just a collection of all the background material and hijinks from Fallout 1 and 2 compiled into one document so that the fans can take a look at it. He even further mentions that some of the information will be incomplete and have holes in it so that future writers can fill them in or write themselves out. At the time of the text creation, Black Isle Studios was still in control of the IP and had plans for future games and entries to the series. However, the ownership of the property would eventually be sold to Bethesda. With that, and the eventual release of Fallout 3, the canonicity of the Fallout Bible was called into question. And oddly enough, it was the Fallout Bible's creator, Chris Avalon, that would be the first to claim the Fallout Bible was no longer canon. In a Twitter exchange regarding the NCR's mechanized cavalry division, Avalon says, the Fallout Bible is no longer canon. He explains in further Twitter replies five years later that the owner of the franchise, now Bethesda, 
decides the lore, and that the original purpose of the Fallout Bible was to consolidate information for the development of Black Isle Studios Fallout 3, aka Van Buren. It wasn't until 2020 that Bethesda made their stance on the Fallout Bible known. In a Gamescom 2020 interview, lead writer Emil Pagliarulo said that canon always starts with the games, and that it's not assumed that everything in the Bible is canon, it's a judgement call. Now, with that being said, the Fallout Bible, despite being non-canon, is a good source of finding some answers to questions that Bethesda has yet to try and answer themselves. And as Bethesda does a good job at staying away from the West Coast lore, a lot of information regarding the West Coast can be found in it. Plus, it'll always be a good source of finding game developer insights when it came to the creation of Fallout 1 and 2. It has its purpose in Fallout. It's just shifted over time. Area 51 Area 51 is a highly classified United States Air Force facility located in southern Nevada. The secrecy surrounding the ongoings of the base has led to many conspiracy theories about it. The most common one is that it houses evidence of extraterrestrial aliens. In Fallout, Area 51 is mentioned in the special alien ship encounter. The vault dweller happens upon a crashed flying saucer with the skeletal remains of two apparent alien beings. On the side of the saucer reads, Property of Area 51, return if found. Now, what some may not know is that Area 51 was actually supposed to make an appearance in Fallout 2, but was cut from the final release of the game. In the Fallout 2 Official Secrets and Strategies Strategy Book, an entry alludes to the inclusion of the location, mentioning that Lynette's talking head, a head that is now serving the role as first citizen of Vault City, was once going to be a spokesperson for a group of scientists living in the ruins of Area 51. Now, another Fallout title just so happened to take place in the same state as the real Area 51. When asked why Area 51 was not included in New Vegas, Sawyer said that 1. Area 51 is not terribly close to Las Vegas, and there's not a whole lot going on in between, providing the reason for why it wasn't in the base game. And 2. Fallout 3 already had an alien-themed DLC, providing a reason why it didn't appear as a DLC. Besides, the Big Empty, in a way, sort of serves that top-secret high-tech facility theme just the same. Dead Money, Secret Endings Speaking of New Vegas, did you know that its first DLC, Dead Money, had not one, but two secret Game Over endings? Both endings come after the Courier has successfully breached the Sierra Madre Vault. If the Courier is a little nosy about Sinclair's personal accounts, they will unknowingly initiate Frederick Sinclair's devious system which will trap themselves in the vault. In the ending narration, it's revealed that the Courier passes away while trapped in the vault. The second alternate ending comes during the Courier's confrontation with Elder Elijah. If the Courier has previously spoken with Veronica, has exhausted all of her dialogue about Elijah, and has poor reputation with the NCR, they will be able to ally themselves with the rogue Elder. Doing so commences an ending narration that describes Elijah and the Courier's takeover of the Mojave using the Toxic Cloud and the Sierra Madre holograms. Gary 666 In the Fallout New Vegas game guide, they have a section dedicated to character archetypes. These are pre-gen characters that you, the player character, can model your own characters after. Gary666 is one of these pre-gens. Gary666, or full name Gary666 the Incandescent Death, is an implacable energy weapons heavy trooper melting mines into piles of ash and goo. The archetype recommends endurance, armor, and regeneration implants, along with either Raul, Arcade, or Veronica as companions. The guide recommends using the Gauss Rifle, Gatling Laser, Flamer, and Plasma Caster, wearing the heaviest armor available, and having a suitable supply of Steady, Psycho, Jet, and Fixer. Both the New Vegas Game Guide and Fallout 3 Game Guide have other weird pre-gens, be it Gary666, the Incandescent Death is, in my opinion, the most unhinged. Far Harbor Killer Gnomes what was once a simple lawn ornament has taken on a dark twist in the post-apocalyptic port town of Far Harbor. Carefully placed around the locale are a series of garden gnomes. Now, what is notable about them is that they're often placed in scenes that depict gruesome crimes and torture. What we may never know is who or what set up these killer scenes. These are the killer gnomes of Far Harbor, a simple yet disturbing Fallout mystery. Fallout 3 Cryolator the Cryolator is a weapon that first appeared in Fallout 4. Absolutely bored out of his mind, the Vault 111 Overseer took up a personal project. Having always wanted a way to make cryogenic freezing portable, the Overseer spent their free time tinkering away at a reverse flamer. 
By the time the sole survivor wakes up from their stasis, the cryolator prototype has been sitting behind a locked glass case, patiently waiting to be used. But did you know that a much cruder version of the cryolator was initially going to appear in Fallout 3? Fallout 3's version appears as some sort of homemade weapon constructing using a crutch, coolant component, and likely would have used liquid nitrogen canisters as ammo, as these were also cut from the game. Now with some cut weapons in Fallout 3 like Wanda the Assault Rifle, they can still be spawned into the game using console commands as the files still exist within the game. However, with the cryolator this isn't the case. The cryolator and its other components do not exist in the game, nor do they exist in the game editor either. With that being said, their meshes and textures do exist, explaining how we know what it was supposed to look like. Nothing too unhinged about it, it's just something that you might not have known. Smile emoji. To make up for the lack of unhingedness with the cryolator, the next two are quite unhinged. We all know that pre-war America spread a ton of propaganda in an effort to get the American population, one, on board with the ludicrous spending for the Sino-American War, but two, also scare them in order to get them to comply with government orders. In Fallout 4 specifically, there are a ton of really cool looking propaganda posters put up throughout the Commonwealth. This specific iceberg entry is about this poster. Their war machine is mobilized, let's prepare ours. The poster shows two large humanoid bots sporting the star representing the People's Republic of China. It would seem that the poster is trying to make the statement that because China has a massive destructive robot, the United States should also make one themselves, obviously referring to the work in progress military project, Liberty Prime. Now the poster is quite obviously American propaganda, but what if it were true? What if China did have the technological capabilities to craft and manufacture their own Liberty Prime? We do know that they have the ability to manufacture their own combat robots, as the Fujinaya intelligence base was manufacturing the Liberator Spider robots underneath the Mama Dolce's food processing plant in Appalachia. What if they are able to upscale that production to manufacture a towering robot? It's not very likely, and only a theory, but that's the exact reason why it makes the unhinged iceberg. Baja Chasing Ghosts Chief Hanlon is quite an old veteran of the NCR Rangers. Heck, he was there to see it grow from a ragtag bunch of abolitionists to a fully formed armed division of the NCR military. As such, Hanlon has plenty of stories and opinions about the NCR to share. When the courier asks Hanlon how the NCR is doing, the chief's response is quite glum. The chief reveals that it's no secret that we've had better campaigns. Holding this whole length of river isn't easy. We're stretched thin and the long 15 just keeps getting longer, slow to get supplies, slower to get reinforcements. NCR's Senate has got funds tied up at the Boneyard, and President Kimball ordered most of our experienced rangers to chase ghosts down in Baja. It's that last line about Baja that has piqued the interest of some theory-crafting fans. What ghosts are these rangers chasing in Baja? While certainly the term chasing ghosts is a lesser known expression typically used when someone is looking for something elusive or non-existent, or even looking for answers about the past, kind of like a wild goose chase. But what if Hanlon was being literal? What if part of the reason the NCR is stretched so thin in the Mojave is because they're busy ghost hunting in Baja? Could the NCR be not only a federal republic, but also act as part-time ghostbusters? It is certainly a goofy interpretation of Hanlon's dialogue, but you've really got to ask why President Kimball would allocate some of the Rangers' best troops to Baja instead of the Mojave. What could possibly be down in Baja that was so important to the NCR? What was more important than securing the Mojave? Even when Sawyer was asked about Hanlon's peculiar dialogue, he responded saying, Who are the ghosts in Baja? It's a mystery. It's an intentional mystery. So there is something going on down south, we just may never know exactly what. Rotface Cut Quest Rotface is a gossiping vagrant posted up in Freeside next to Mick and Ralph's. In exchange for caps, Rotface has 30 unique pieces of gossip, news, tips, and rumors to share. And while in the final release of New Vegas, that's all Rotface does, just spouts gossip, he was originally going to have a more expanded role with the courier directly influencing the future of the ghoulish panhandler. As the courier trades caps for information, Rotface uses his newfound wealth to acquire some new threads. Sporting a hat similar to that of Paradise Falls slaver leader Eulogy Jones's own hat. But there was supposed to be more. He was supposed to be seen sporting the full Eulogy Jones suit and ask the courier what they think of it. 
Depending on the courier's response, there would be four outcomes for Rotface. He would either attempt to mug the courier, leave Freeside with his small fortune, be murdered by a Freeside thug for his fortune, or join the followers of the apocalypse. While I'm sure this cut content would have been cool to have, I don't think there's one Fallout player that is up in arms because Rotface didn't have a more expanded role in New Vegas. He's just such a minor character. Wind Brahmin. And the last entry on Tier 1 of the unhinged Fallout Iceberg is an unmarked quest in New Vegas. Wind Brahmin Wrangler is an unmarked quest in Fallout New Vegas. When the courier approaches the cattle pen at Brooks Tumbleweed Ranch, they will be startled by a nightkin uncloaking their stealth field. This is the Wind Brahmin Wrangler. Now, what exactly is a Wind Brahmin? Well, according to the world's only Wrangler of them, they're just simply tumbleweeds. Now, who on earth would want to buy a tumbleweed? Well, the answer better be you, because if you don't fork over all your caps for a Wind Brahmin, the Wrangler will turn hostile. I'll be the first to admit it, it's definitely a strange business model. Now what is truly unhinged about the Wind Brahmin, and it actually freaks me out quite a bit, is that there are two cut versions of tumbleweeds in the New Vegas game files. One is called the Radioactive Tumbleweed, and the other is called a Wind Brahmin. What's freaky is that they're identified in the files as creatures, meaning that they move on their own and can be killed. Was the Wind Brahmin Wrangler truly full of it? Or maybe he knew something that the rest of us didn't. The tumbleweeds? they might be alive. Now, like I said before, the creature variants of the tumbleweeds were cut from the final release of New Vegas, meaning that all tumbleweeds in the game are not alive. And that is tier 1 of the unhinged Fallout iceberg. I plan on doing a new tier each week, so stay tuned for those. I have the iceberg made already, but if you think I'm missing something or definitely want me to talk about a certain topic, leave it in the comments, and I'll see if I can add some new entries into a tier. Thanks for listening. That's all from me today, folks. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. NCR Senate has got funds tied up at the boneyard. And President Kimball ordered our most experienced rangers to chase ghosts down at Baja.